brought me when the uh, person who he was hot for you is so charismatic. But, uh, I'm Anna. Um, I'm a PhD student with the Conseil at the University of Washington. And I'm going to talk to you about the uh, current work that we're doing in polygenetic and the need for the species of mutation in morale uh, in a family called Smeesey. So uh, the Polysmeesey are uh, in a tropical distribution. They're a unique family of plants because they live in uh, river rapids and in waterfalls, so in fast flowing water ecosystem. And unlike any other group of angiosperms except for Hydrostachyaceae, uh, they're also the largest group of truly aquatic angiosperms. There's about 300 species, and they're said to be highly endemic, and so according to the literature, each species would occur in one, two, or only a couple of rivers, and very few species would occur uh, in more than that or have a wider distribution. So the, uh, they have been tropical distribution, but they're mostly centered in the neotropics, and uh, the extreme conditions that these plants experience have resulted in highly modified morphologies. And so a lot of people think they're algae, but they're not. They're uh, angiosperms. They live attached to rocks, and for the most part, they're uh, under the water. Um, but in the tropics, as the water level drops in the dry season, they produce flowers that project above the water surface. Um, and these are the fruits, are dry capsules that have hundreds and hundreds of seeds, uh, like 500 seeds, and according to the literature, they do not disperse well. And this might explain the high levels of endemism reported for these um, fungi. So to talk about Marathrum, which is the group that I'm presenting today, according to the taxonomical treatment of this group, there's one published monography in 1951. Uh, Marathrum has 22 species. And they have uh, prostrate stems, and that makes them different from Athanasia, that has uh, erect stems. They have uh, solitary flowers, and the flowers are subtended by one bract, which in close maize is called spathella. And that makes them different to the rock stars of the close maize, Morera. They have these very large inflorescences that hold 40 to 100 flowers. Each flower is subtended by one bract, too. And I'm going to take this opportunity to mention Tom Philbrick. He is, I think, one of the people that has contributed the most to the taxonomy of this group. Uh, and so when I started working with Marathrum, I of course contacted uh, Tom Filbert. And uh, he said, well, you're gonna work with Marathrum, that's really great, uh, Marathrum is a taxonomic mess. And uh, the reason for that is um, most of the characters used in the current taxonomical classification are vegetative. So let me explain something. Here are two species coexisting in this river in the same rock. And so the species to the right, which is described as Marathrum mutili, it has simple leaves and, and they're laminar. And it's the only species in the genus that has simple leaves, the only one. And on the right is Marathrum cuniculaceum that has actually, it's quite a good species complex. It has um, highly dissected leaves. And that's what makes them different. But then you will look at them and you say like, well, they have also very different flowers, different colors of flowers. But as they are described in the taxonomical treatment, they have flowers that vary in color and number of stamens throughout their distribution. So in here, they look different. Um, so, 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 so can we, because the vegetative traits are the ones that are used, how much can we rely on those vegetative traits? Here is a picture of Marathrum squamosum, and you will see that there's individuals that are in contact with the water, there's individuals that are exposed to the rock, and this is what they look like. So the ones that are in full contact with the water have these very long leaves uh, that are also dissected, and the ones exposed look like mosses. So uh, there's a lot of phenotypic capacity, uh, which may be confusing for uh, the taxonomy of this group. And when it comes to the flowers, as I was saying, most of uh, the species that have wide distributions also, as described in the taxonomical treatment, vary in terms of the number of stamens and uh, the color of the stamens. There's one species in Marathrum that is different, so it doesn't have a complete wall of stamens, but the stamens are only on one side. Um, when it comes to the fruits, they are using the taxonomical treatment a lot. Uh, but there's just a number of traits, like the number of reeves that are per locule, if the reeves are winged or not, or the extent of the, uh, how wide this corolla cup is, uh, this, sorry, the cup is. So based on what I said, I'm gonna start with these premise that genomic data serves as the tool that to gain insight into the biology and evolution of this group. And tomorrow I'm gonna to give a talk on uh, we sequence 
full class homes, as in both full class homes, and we did gain some insight into the biology of this group. So the questions that I'm going to address today is if currently accepted species in Morathrum correspond to genetic units, and uh, um, I'm going to try to understand the evolutionary relationships in Morathrum if reverse form plates. So uh, this is um, so over three years. We I'm from this country, Colombia, North and South America. And so the sampling design that we have is to fit uh, the biogeographic study that we're uh, conducting. So we sample uh, approximately 50 sample localities, 167 individuals of Marathon. We built uh, DD rat seek libraries and then we sequenced them. And so here I'm presenting the results using uh, with 19 individuals and more than 92,000 seeds, which look like a lot of data, but there's one characteristic of my data set that is missing data. And missing data is inherent to rat seek studies, but my case is extreme. So there's no loci that are shared across all of them, um, across all of my samples. So how does that translate in uh, my case? Well, case, uh, some plates are well supported, but most, most of the deep nodes do not have any resolution. So we do not, not do, don't know to what extent missing data is affecting the tree that we get. And so I've been looking at my data for months and months and months from different <laughs> angles. And so I would love any help that you can if you have ideas on why I have so much missing data, that'd be great. Uh, but, I, but I do want to focus on something. Here I'm showing you uh, something in green. Those green things are those uh, uh, individuals that would be identified as Marathon UTV. And those, uh, sometimes I have uh, strong support plates that have individuals of more often utility with individuals that have highly bisected leaves. And so that may be an indicator that uh, these species are not species, so they're not plates. However, missing data again is that, uh, how much is that influencing uh, our analysis? And so after sitting so much, I said, well, I have to do something with data I have. So here, this is one drainage basin, uh, one of the drainage basins that I'm working with. And so we decided to subset our data and make, make subsets of uh, uh, populations um, that, of plants that come from uh, adjacent drainage basins, and including three rivers at a time. With the thinking process, the thinking process is if we have populations and those populations maybe are closely related to one another, then fewer mutations. Oh, because I forgot to say, with the, sorry, with the chloroplast data, we might have indicators that there's accelerated rates of evolution in this group of plants. And so I thought, well, maybe if I include populations that are closely related to one another, I have less, less mutations would have accumulated, and so I have less allele dropout, and maybe I recover more loci, and I have less missing data. And so the uh, sampling scheme would be sampling three populations of population from the rivers at the time, and then shifting, and shifting, and shifting. And so um, here are the results. We find two patterns, and this is color coded. So, to my, well, it wasn't a surprise, but when I included few, uh, fewer populations, only three, I do get a lot more loci, and that translates into high support for most of the branches. And so this is color coded, and you'll see that the populations from each river in this case are uh, form well supported. But also, I want to show that uh, these things that are highlighted don't look too well, but are in bold, those are the things that would be described as marathon utility. So that confirms our results that marathon utility is not highlighted. <coughs> uh, and when we do uh, an admixture analysis of that, and then again, this is color coded, we find a strong population structure across rivers, meaning that those clades are also genetically distinct across rivers. And, and that's not just for that assembly, but more assemblies where then we, uh, for, for the most part, recover rivers as clays, populations rivers with a uh, strong structure. But there's this other, this other pattern that we have. This, this river here was uh, recovered again as a clay. But then these three rivers here that I'm highlighting here, so uh, the red one, blue, and this is gonna show us orange, um, come together. And that might be, um, perhaps evidence of gene flow uh, between rivers that are adjacent to each other, or maybe it could be river capture events. So river are dynamic entities that can be separate uh, and then come together at some point in time. So yeah, that happened with uh, these three rivers. 
So the this one, like this uh, clear blue was also written by Dennis as, as a clay, but these three are the ones that are the top. So for conclusions for this part, phylogenetic analysis contradicts taxonomy, macromethyl and Nicolaisium are not multilated, according to Matija. And then some rivers form plates, but there's instances that could be interpreted perhaps as gene flow or river capture. But then here I'm showing you some of those assemblies that were really nice to show that nice pattern of reverse forming plates. But then here I'm showing you uh, uh, this publication in Systematic Botany 2011 using two chloroplast markers and one nuclear marker. And you'll see that in this case, Marathon Cronicolaceum forms a plate. Marathon Cronicolaceum forms a plate. And like, so it's like, it, it goes together with the taxonomy. So then I was thinking, what is happening to my data? And then, uh, so I read more and more in this paper, and they also acknowledge this, is uh, most of these, these individuals here come from the same locality. And these individuals here come from the same locality, and so forth. So that does not mean these studies may not be contradictory. They might just show that there's, again, a lot of, like a very strong biogeographic pattern here. So could this be convergent evolution, or phenotypic plasticity in this group of plants? Or is there incongruence among data sets, chloroplast and nuclear data? And so what we're gonna do now is try and bypass missing data by using hype sequence, so a combination of sequence capture and genome scheme to resolve relationships within the genus uh, comparing nuclear and chloroplast data. And then, then we will go back to our rat seek data set uh, after we make sense of our data to do population level analysis. So with that, uh, I wanna thank all my funding sources at uh, the University of Washington that has you know, supported me so much, the Olmsted Lab, my advisor, Dick Olmsted, of course, and uh, my, uh, our collaborators, Tom Kilberg, Brad Google, and Claudia Bobby, and then all my uh, field assistants. And thank you all for coming. We have time for some questions. Yes. But you said, have you tried looking at, at notes that are poorly supported? And seeing how many, how many SNPs could potentially su su support that node. So the problem, yeah, the problem with that is what I think is happening. So regardless, regard, regardless of the amount of SNPs that I get, it seems like I'm getting uh, those concerns that are just not bearable. So that's what I'm thinking, because if you look, so that's something that I was, uh, that made me think so much, if you look at the branch links, they're really short. So these links are really similar to one another. Then I was thinking, why do I have so much missing data if I was thinking it's accelerated rates of evolution, but that the branch links are really short. And so I thought, well, what's happening maybe that I'm just recovering the low side that are not there. So what actually my project is about, this is one part of it, is trying to gain some insight into what the history of the rivers is like based on a calibrated phylogeny of these plants. Uh -huh. like, and then the role of being these shaping drainage basins in North and South America. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's thank Anna again. <laughs>